Hi, I'm Danny Black, and welcome to the At Sports Bulk Podcast. On this podcast, I will be talking sports cards, collectibles, memorabilia. I'll be interviewing hobby guests. I will be talking about my own thoughts. I'll cover regular sports that relate to the hobby. That's the fun part. More importantly, I want you along for the ride. So click like and follow for more content, and I hope you enjoy the episode. Well, hello. I am Danny Black, and back for another episode of Sports Bolt, the podcast. Uh, today's a fun one for me because uh, many of you probably don't know, I don't talk about it a lot. Uh, many years ago in the late 90s, the Baltimore Orioles had a uh, sports art and memorabilia gallery. Uh, they always claimed it was the largest sports-only art gallery in the world, so we'll take We'll take that at face value. And uh, I managed that for them for a couple of years. Uh, but it was an incredible exposure for me to a world that I had was not uh, previously familiar with. Um, and, you know, a lot of us may not realize Leroy Neiman or Norman Rockwell. We think about some of their pieces, but, but the idea that you could make money, you know, painting sports. Um, and then um, it evolved into I'm running a gallery with artists who are full time uh artist uh with the with the subject of sports and 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 that's just awesome to me um sport is life and i'll get all meta and deep later with my guest uh but i just you know this is a cool one so have a little fun um i'm not gonna even be able to touch on showing you all of his work so i highly highly suggest uh you follow him on instagram and uh, check out his website and with all that being said, let me bring in my f- my friend, Greg Kreimler. What's going up, Greg? Hey, Danny. How are you? Good. How are you doing? I'm good. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I've done some research. You're a, I'm not going to hold it against you because I'm in Baltimore, but you're a New York guy. Uh, <laughs> uh, Brooklyn, am I correct? Or, um, yes. Yes, Brooklyn, right. which makes up for some of it because I'm, you know, uh, I'm a Kofax guy. Oh, well, uh, oh, I, in fact, in honor of you, I want you. Oh to yeah, there you go. Is that there. the fifty-seven tops? Uh, yes. Cool. Which, which I'm also putting together the set. So you know, this is the closest I've come to getting the Kofax so far. <laughs> uh, but, but you, 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 I know you had an exposure to baseball cards early, which I love, um, and 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 that kind of got you into your your exposure to sports and and baseball um and kind of from that point on you were already drawing as an illustrator so will you start with your art background and and kind of your illustrator history and how that touched on sports sure well i mean the the drawing aspect you know started when i was pretty young and uh you know when i was kind of watching cartoons at the age of five and six or whatever. And uh, my father, uh, mother would tape, uh, you know, my favorite episodes of He-Man and G.I. Joe or whatever. And I would kind of just like sit there in front of the television, you know, and pause the recording and then just kind of draw what I saw. Uh, And, you know, it was right after that, that I kind of discovered my, my father's baseball card collection. Uh, And if, you know, for the people who, uh, who don't know, you know, my, my father, uh, he's still alive, thankfully, uh, but grew up in uh, New York City in uh, the uh, late 40s and early 50s. And he was mainly collecting those cards, uh, which were basically like your Bowman and, and Topps uh, issues that for the most part were illustrated. Uh, and they weren't, you know, they weren't photography uh, uh, until a little bit later. And I guess when I was... Until... 1950. There you go. There you go. That's like, that's like the first straight one, right? Um, and uh, yeah, I just I saw what he had left of his baseball card collection, and I guess something kind of clicked in my head that I could uh, that I could draw uh, these baseball players who you know who my father loved, you know, to kind of get like the the proverbial pat on the head, you know, good job, son. Um, and so I did that for a while. And, you know, I would kind of draw Mickey Mantle and Yogi Berra and, and uh, you know, all of like the, the big cards from, uh, from those eras. Uh, and I eventually kind of fell out of love, not didn't, I didn't fall out of love with baseball, but I, I, I got older. 
you know, I, I went through puberty, I got awkward, I, you know, got ignored by girls, that sort of thing. At that time, I kind of went into the world of comic books and was kind of really into uh, uh, fantasy and science fiction imagery. And it turned out that when I uh, went to college, uh, the School of Visual Arts, I decided, okay, well, I'm going to be a book cover illustrator doing science fiction fantasy stuff. And baseball was kind of like, it was still in my life to an extent, but uh, it was very much, uh, at least artistically, it was in the rear view. It wasn't even anything that I well, thought of. A considered. lot of people don't know when you're from Brooklyn, it's actually injected in the hospital to be a baseball fan forever. <laughs> so, well, so, so, so you can never really get rid of it. You know, it's in, it's, it's in there somewhere. Well, well, technically, though, the thing is, technically, I, I don't want to hear it. No, 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 no. I, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I only came to Brooklyn about uh, 15 years ago. Oh, so man. I grew up uh, in a suburb outside of the city. But my mother is a Brooklyn Dodgers fan and dad is a Yankees fan. And somehow, you know, There's happily there. married for 50 years or whatever. I don't know. How <laughs> that, I don't know how that works. But, uh, you know, I, I had to be a baseball fan just because of that. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I kind of, I was in school and, and basically I was, I was training and, and kind of trying to build a portfolio of, uh, stuff to take out to art directors and hopefully get jobs. And I, f I guess I, I fell out of love with the sci-fi fantasy stuff. And but, but I just want to clarify, these are still illustrator jobs. Yeah. Yeah. These, I mean, basically at the time, my my goal was to do these kind of book cover, like commercial illustrator jobs. Uh, and that was just kind of the path that I had set myself on. I didn't really, it was like tunnel vision. I didn't really think that there was anything else that was going to happen. Uh, and senior year, uh, my last year there, you're kind of, uh, as an illustrator, uh, what you, what you're expected to do, at least at the time was kind of build a, 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 a mature, mature uh, portfolio of artwork that you can use in your portfolio. So when you graduate, uh, when you graduate from school, you can take it to art directors and you can, you know, try to get work, you know, whether it's a book cover or magazine illustration or whatever. Uh, and at that time, I kind of wasn't really feeling the sci-fi fantasy thing. And I was floundering a little bit. Uh, just in terms of subject matter. So I, you know, I was still working hard and, and painting a lot and just trying to hone skills and things, but uh, it wasn't until in, uh, in that senior year in my portfolio class when a teacher uh, gave, the, uh, gave the class an assignment to, uh, to illustrate a relationship. And, you know, he would generally give us those those broad topics so we could kind of take it wherever we wanted to take it and somehow like the first idea that i had was just the relationship between a, a pitcher and a batter uh so I, I figured okay this can kind of be uh similar to what i did when i was a kid and i can you know do a painting of mickey mantle and something you but know this is a study in human dynamic yeah <laughs> <laughs> absolutely it's it's like it, it works both ways you know it kind of it it fit it fit the the idea of of a relationship and it also it allowed me to kind of jump into a subject that i had familiarity with and something that i kind of had dabbled with in the past so i kind of jumped at that opportunity and i i, I did this painting you know and i i researched all this material and you know I, I was very caught up on mickey mantle you know looking like mickey mantle because i know how how anal us sports fans can yes. be and how yes. anal my father is uh and uh yeah I, I did this painting and i was i was really happy with it and you know i brought it in for the critique and and the the professor was happy with it the the kids kids my uh what would you call them my peers my classmates they seemed to think that it was a, a really nice image and uh that was kind of like oh wow this worked and this kind of this pulled on the heartstrings you know that this was this was something new uh and it's basically been 
that way ever since, where the focus has been more about the subject matter. I don't want to be cliche. Was it the aha moment? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, it really was. Um, it wasn't. So like, so you walked out of the room, it was like, after everything, this is what I'm doing now. I mean, <laughs> it wasn't quite that, but it was like, okay, well, this is the first thing that I've, that I've painted that I really kind of enjoyed uh, on a level that I hadn't really enjoyed other stuff. And I wasn't really, I wasn't thinking about I wasn't thinking about the piece as kind of like a commercial venture because normally, you know, when you, when you get an assignment in those classes, I would kind of, uh, I would, you know, take this assignment and I, I do a painting and I would kind of design it. So like, okay, well, you know, I, uh, I'm tasked with doing a book cover. Okay. So I have to leave space on top, you know, and some dead space on the bottom. So you can put type there theoretically. So in a way, it's kind of like you're thinking that the final product is actually the reproduction. It's the commercial. It's item. the com commercialization. Right. So, so is this like it, Mad Men mixed with The Breakfast Club? Uh, <laughs> like with Ken Burns directing? Like I, 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 I this this sounds like a, a real kind of a, a transition, uh, both personally, artistically. Yeah, yeah. With with uh, fewer, well, you know what? Fewer people wearing suits. But I'd well, say I, just I saw a picture you posted on Instagram uh, with a bunch of illustrators uh, recently. Uh, oh, with the uh, the comic guys. <laughs> yes, yes. So uh, I, I knew you were hanging out with a rough crowd. I could tell by that picture. Well, they, listen, very dangerous. Those those guys were uh, like those were the the guys who uh, who basically formed uh, Image Comics in the early 1990s, which is when I was like in the thick of my comic collecting. And they, let me tell you, at the time, they were literally like rock stars. And, you know, they would come to to signings, you know, at, at various comic stores, you know, throughout, throughout, you know, the country. And you'd have lines out the door, people wanting to meet them and, and bow at the altar of these artists. Uh, which you wouldn't really figure was the case when you look at them because, you know, they just look like a bunch of dorks. <laughs> I mean, not to be a jerk, but <laughs> that's one of my favorite things is to be a dork. So yeah, yeah, to exactly. me that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Um, so I, 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 I love that. I love the, uh, the, the, the whole, the whole honesty and we've all been through that and, I don't know that I'm ever going to grow up or ever not be a dork. And so uh, I, I very much embrace it. And that's why I sit here wearing a Sandy Koufax t-shirt. So there you you know, go. Right, here we are. Okay. <laughs> um, I have an artistic question and please for, for all you baseball fans, stick with me on this. Uh, <laughs> the, 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 the choice uh, in your, your choice of medium is oil on linen currently. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. It's usually oil on uh, stretched linen or oil on linen that's mounted to a board for uh, the smaller paintings. Okay. That's, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, not the easiest medium for realistic detail. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a very, it's as, a very challenging yeah. medium for sure. I know other artists who I respect tremendously who, who do great work, who I don't can't imagine them painting on linen. Um, <laughs> I, so I guess how did it evolve from somebody who's illustrating, which I don't, I don't know if it was, if, if, if the, uh, the canvas mattered for some of the illustrations that you were doing or if it was paper. Um, but tell me about the evolution of the physical uh, tools to the oil and linen. Uh, sure. Uh, yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, the basically when I was doing the paintings in school, when I was doing, you know, the illustrations, for the most part, what I was using, you know, was kind of like illustration board, which is basically just a, a coated cardboard that you can paint on, you know, the, the, uh, the permanence of such an object is not really uh, that strong, you know, it's just like a kind of a flimsy thing to work on. Uh, and again, you know, to the point where you're kind of concerned about, 
you're concerned about the reproduction of the image kind of being that final product. So your painting, or I mean, some people do this, where you're painting in a way that isn't necessarily, it's not going to, these paintings aren't meant to last that long. Like there's certain things that you can do to kind of speed up the drying process, you know, using a certain medium that kind of lets this paint dry within a few hours as opposed to a few days. And, you know, the trade-off is that uh, eventually that medium kind of makes the paint kind of brittle and, you know, it can kind of start flaking off uh, after a couple of years or many years. So in a way you're kind of trading permanence for speed, if that makes sense. And when I guess I started doing the paintings and started, uh, you know, thinking less about illustration, you know, I became concerned with the longevity of the physical object. So, so really, the conservation w w w was a big factor for you. Was this once you had already knew you were doing historical objects as your work? Did that play into that decision because you're representing a historical object that you wanted? I, I guess it's weird to kind of keep that permanency of the history. I mean, it... it I, it might have, like, subconsciously, it might have played a small role. I think I was more concerned with working on a surface that had uh, that had a bit of an impact. Because when you see kind of illustration board, you know, for the most part, it's maybe, you know, a 16 by 20 or an 18 by 24 or like 20 by 30 kind of thing at the largest and it just there's something about having you know this physical piece of of you know stretched primed linen on you know stretcher bars in a way it's kind of like you're you're no longer this is going to sound awful but like you're not playing in the commercial world and you're kind of starting to have a conversation with artists who have their work in museums you know, it's not necessarily like a quality thing because, you know, sure. not at that quality, but, but. Well, first of all, you're, you're, you're more than museum quality. So let's just get over that. Well, I, 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 I get to be the judge of that as my podcast. So go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate it, even if you're wrong. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you know, it's like, oh, I can, you know, my, one of my favorite artists, John Singer Sargent or Claude Monet, it's like these people painted on linen or, or cotton that is stretched to, to stretcher bars and they're hanging in a museum. Hey, I paint stuff and, you know, have it stretched on, on stretcher bars and doesn't really hang in a museum, but, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that, that became important. Okay. Well, you just doubled down on where I wanted to go next anyway. I, and I, and I said this to you off air, um, you, you happen to be an artist by the way. And I know that, you are a romantic historian and i'm gonna say um one of my favorite quotes you said this and and, and uh, I'm loosely uh, it was when people look at my work i want them to smell the same stuff and hear the same music that they would hear at a ballpark when they were younger anybody who says that is a romantic about their subject matter um your attention to detail um I want to talk about because I want to, uh, I feel like I'm, I'm prosecuting my case here. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I would like you to talk about the hours of research versus hours of brush time. I think people would expect 99% brush time or, you know, right. you know like, the, um, could you talk about, cause I, I, I have a vague sense. I can't even imagine uh, depend. And I know it depends on the subject and the pieces, but how how much research and how much work goes into the being the historian uh, when you do a piece? I mean, it it varies from piece to piece. For me, so if I'm painting if I'm painting a a modern player, if I'm painting a Derek Jeter or an Ichiro or you know even someone from the '70s or uh, even late '60s, for the most part, um, a lot of there isn't a ton of research that has to be done because a lot of the, a lot of the stuff that I try to kind of hone in on and, and be sensitive to, whether it's, you know, light, color, you know, weather conditions, stuff like that, 
you can kind of you can kind of discern that from the photography that I'm basing the work on. Uh, obviously, with modern stuff, everything's in color, and you're seeing a play from 37 different angles. Uh, so it's kind of like any question that I would have, it's going to be answered somewhere, uh, whether it's you know in the broadcast or in the photo itself or whatever. But when you get further back, uh, you know we're talking pre. 1950s pre 1940s uh that's when a lot more research kind of goes into it um for the most part the photography that i base my paintings on uh is black and white uh you know obviously <laughs> as my kids uh as my kids like to tell me now you know obviously like when my when my when my parents were were young, obviously the world was in black and white, which is what I thought. Sure. Uh, growing up. Chocolate milk comes from brown cows. I'm exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, it makes perfect sense, right? Yeah. Um, so I I think I I think I realized early on, and by early on I mean like in school or whatever, yeah. that there was a power to taking something that we all see as black and white, that we know as black and white and kind of breathing life into it. And part of doing that, part of breathing that life into it for me was about doing it accurately. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm very OCD uh, as I think a lot of baseball fans can be, you know, very- Or you know, historians, yes, yes. Or historians, right. You know, the, the specifics are, are very important to us and we get caught up in stuff like that. And, you know, from very early on, I, I was I was very conscious of the fact that these players, these guys had to look, they had to look right. You know, it wasn't just it wasn't just a portrait thing where I can say, okay, well, here's a body and I can just plop, you know, Hannes Wagner's sure. face onto it. You know, his body had to look like Hannes Wagner's. He needs to have, you know, 37 feet long arms and and kind of ball legged and you know if he's swinging a bat it has to be the kind of bat that you would know that wagner used so a lot of that information kind of comes from the research that i would do and that's whether you know whether i'm i'm reading about these players in books whether i'm reading about them in newspapers you know like kind of first-hand accounts sure uh you know whether i'm looking for uh for video footage of them it's it's all it's all a part of that process of making these things seem more real and making them seem like it's more of a uh, more of a window into the past than necessarily like idol worship, if that makes sense. It, it does. And I want to phrase this cor the right way. Do you feel a sense of and I'm, if, if I use the wrong word, please correct me. Pressure, responsibility to the athlete. Um, it, you know, when you when you do a work of art, and then does that pressure or whatever that feeling is change when it's a subject like Babe Ruth, who has been done by so many, you know, people that that the public has seen just so many versions, and there is so much photography, and and, and it is supposed, and to, to to flip side that, if if you remember, and I'm sure you probably do. Um, a work of art that you did or a player, Jose Mendez. Um, and, and, and the difference then with the public's knowledge of what that player, you know, may look like, cause you're really the first exposure for a lot of people to that player. Right. And, and, and that's a real, that's a real contrast. Yeah. It's, it's, it's an interesting thing to think about because you know, like you like you mentioned, everybody everybody knows Babe Ruth. Everybody knows what Babe Ruth looks like. So there's a pressure to get things right. You know, I like Babe Ruth's eyes being brown, you know, and his hair being like a, a deep brown, blackish color or whatever, and you know, his weight fluctuation throughout his career. That's stuff that, you know, obviously I have to pay attention to. Um and I obviously know that there might be more people who would uh call me out on something that is wrong um which happens uh because you know i do make mistakes uh here and there and i usually try to catch them myself uh 
and you know fix them before people notice them. But when it comes to someone like a Jose Mendez, uh, you know, here's here's this guy who primarily uh, played in Cuba, and you know, this is when baseball kind of saturated the country there, and you know, it's in the early 1900s, and we don't have a ton of photography of this guy. You know, it's not he's not a, a household name here. The, the the AP didn't have a beat reporter on. No, <laughs> yeah, yeah. no one, no one is taking photos of him, you right. know, coming out of a hotel, smoking a cigar. Or right. like that. Um, His TikTok account was fantastic, though. I got to tell you, it, it was. It, it was a <laughs> um, But yeah, it's it's like there. In a way, the the pressure, the pressure. It's like the same amount of pressure, but it's a different kind of pressure where. I just, I want to do enough research to know that I've gotten something right um, with someone like a Jose Mendez. Uh, because yeah, in, in some ways, I guess if I'm, you know, I, I have this, I have this, this following, you know, I'm so lucky to have it. And I think that it kind of gives me this platform to kind of show people ball players that they might not know anything about. And then, like you said, it's like, if I'm their first kind of exposure to them, I want it to be the right exposure. <laughs> so it's uh, there's a pressure to get things right on all accounts. It's just, it's harder to do so with the lesser known players. Um, I also think that there are fewer people who would call you out on it. Um, and that's why I was, I don't know if pressure is the exact word, but th there, there's a something there that I would think would, would be different. Yeah, yeah, no, pressure pressure is a good word. It's uh it's just it's weird whether uh, I guess it's important to note that there's pressure that I feel from uh, you know maybe the uh, the people who are viewing the painting uh you know I'll feel a certain amount of pressure from them uh you know for a Babe Ruth painting but for Jose Mendez it's like all the pressure's on me. Right. Uh, yeah, because you know there's so it's like there's so few people who know who some of those guys are, and Jose Mendez, you know, he's a Hall of Famer, but he's kind of like this lower tier Hall of Famer, and you know he pitched a hundred and change years ago, so we don't know much about him. Uh, his nickname was the Black Christy Matthewson, if I have yeah. that correct. Yeah. yeah. He was just, just to give a small sample of of talent that might be the closest thing we get to a good scouting report but yeah and and from what from the reading that I've done from him or about him I'm sorry uh and people who I've talked to who are kind of like the experts in you know baseball on the islands from that uh, period of time they kind of they equate him to being kind of like the Pedro Martinez type where you know he has this devastating curveball and, and this overpowering fast. I was say, not a bad comp. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, okay. <laughs> right, right. Pedro Martinez, no big deal. <laughs> sure. That's I mean, wow. <laughs> so part of the reason that that, that um I love your work is, is not just the aesthetic value. And this comes from somebody who I will proudly say managed an art gallery with no discernible skill to do that. Um, <laughs> but but I, I I am I I will say I'm a baseball uh, lover historian and I consider myself a romantic and a passionate person on baseball specifically um, and my family um, and, and so you know I've clicked with you and your work since you know day one and I I think uh, when we really met I. I walked right up to you and just said, I love, I love your stuff. Um, uh, you know, and, and, um, I, I said, I made a mistake by, by not finding you earlier or you weren't old enough. I forget what it was to, to, to have your stuff in the gallery back then. I, I, maybe I'd still be managing the gallery or still be in business, but, uh, <laughs> you, you know, well, I, I think when you were doing that, I was probably like just out of art school. And, okay. uh, I think that, like the guy, the people who had the work in, in that gallery, you know, the, the Arthur K. Millers, the Andy Jarinkos, like those were the people who I kind of looked up to and still look up to. And I don't want to say like modeled my career out after, but 
um, definitely had them in mind. And it it sh- I'm so- well, I mean, did it show you that you could make a career doing this? Yeah, that that's exactly what it was. Okay. Um, it, I mean, it started where like I was doing, I did a few pieces for uh, for Bill Goff, you know, the guy who did GoodSportsArt.com. And, you know, he had this whole kind of system where he had all these artists working in, you know, for him and making these paintings and basically selling reproductions of them. And I did that for, you know, a couple of paintings. I have not thought of that in forever. I'm sorry. That was just, <laughs> I, I just had such a moment when you said that. I was like, oh, my gosh. Do I yeah. Remember that? Yeah, absolutely. It's old, old school stuff. Yes. But yes. I, yes. I loved that stuff. But I like it when I got into it and I, I started making prints of that work or he started making prints of that work. I just, it, I didn't, I didn't love it. Um, because I kind of felt like there was a, there was a different way or there was a better way to, uh, to do it for me where, you know, I could do paintings, not make reproductions and, you know, people can kind of, feel special or, or happy about the fact that they have like a one of one original. And I was about to say for card, for card people uh, or, or for any other artist, you know, I, I, I the, the, this is not, I mean, this is pretty, it seems obvious. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, I mean, it's, you know, not to like, I'm not know, knocking crap anybody. About, yeah. Right. Right. Because you know, whatever works for, for anyone, that's great. Um, but just for me personally, I just, I really liked the idea of treating it as more of a, uh, I hate using this phrase, but you know, like a fine art enterprise. Yep. <laughs> I know you're, you're, so, you're, you're such big art. You're, 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 you're part, you're part of the man, you know? Right. <laughs> right. It's so exalted. It's right. so important. Well, it's so funny because you're saying this and I'm thinking, what sports art do I have in my house? Which ones are prints? Which ones are originals? Oh my gosh. And I'm thinking like right away, the first thing I'm thinking is, okay, so I have a hand touch G clay. So I'm going to like say, okay, so I feel better about that real quick. <laughs> um, and then I have a Neiman um, etching print uh, that's, that's numbered. And I'm sorry, I can't afford the original for Neiman. So other than that, all my work is original. Um, and, and I just got a, a little panic there thinking about that. So, well, yes. but there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with no, that. but I love it. I love the original. There is something to it, you know? Yeah. And I think that's why, you know, I, I, I was very blessed at the gallery to, to make friends with some of the artists. And, um, uh, as you know, probably from early in your career, when you have friends and you have art, sometimes the friends and the art get connected. Um, and, oh yeah. And, and, and uh, I was very lucky and have some original pieces from 20, 25 years ago um, that, that are treasures of mine uh, from artists I was friends with. So um, I, ho- I hope that, you know, the pieces of yours that trickled out early, uh, you know, are, are cherished as much as the ones I have um, of my friends. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure they are. Um, absolutely. So uh, that being said, um, I told you at the beginning, I want to have you back um, and go through like 400 more questions, uh, if that's okay with you. Yeah, that, that's great. I would love that. These okay. were great questions. This is not like, this is not the kind of stuff that people usually ask. Not not that there's anything wrong with the other stuff that people ask, but um, this is fun. You know, it's fun talking about uh, about this stuff in a way that I haven't really, you know, voiced to other people. So, well, well tell your tell your friends we're on YouTube. Uh, like and subscribe. Oh, I will. <laughs> um, and we are sponsored by Blockbuster and KB Toys. So, uh, you know, we we, we uh, work hard there. Um, I'm going to throw you in the green room just for two seconds. I, I pulled the blue M and M's just as you requested, and I will be right with you, uh, Greg. Thank you so much for coming on. <laughs> thank you, Danny. It was my pleasure. All right. So uh, to everybody else, um, I hope you had as much fun as I did. Uh, I could listen to the stories uh, all day and and probably would have if if I didn't cut myself off. Um, In fact, if you look carefully, you'll see me slouching as I just start listening to the story and call myself having to uh, reset my chair there in the middle. Um, So that always means it's a good time. And uh, if you're listening on the podcast, um, definitely uh, check out uh, Greg's work and his Instagram account is fantastic. 
Um, so uh, to everybody, you know, I don't do outros. Uh, so thank you for watching and we'll see you next time.